Well, happy spring, everybody. We are delighted that you are here on CHLY 101.7 FM. I'm Kathy Holmes, and I am delighted to be your host on Act 3. And in the Zoom booth with me today is a lady by the name of Claire Deneen. She is with Bitch and Chickens. I can't tell you how excited I am about it because I love those birds so much. Claire, welcome to the program. Delighted that you're here. And thanks for having me. So, okay, so let's get into the meat and potatoes of this, because I got to tell you, as I, at the start of this, I got all happy, happy, because especially I know Easter's coming around the corner. Chickens are my favorite. I love them 24 seven. What got you into doing chickens? Well, I think when I was a kid, I always had some kind of pet, a dog, a cat, but it was salamanders and snakes and turtles and gerbils. Uh, but I lived in the city. I grew up in Toronto. My earliest memory, I think, of chickens was in kindergarten. We had one of those incubator school programs. Yeah. And years later, I thought, geez, I wonder what ever happened to those little chicks? Because in the city, where did they go to? I don't know. But uh, yeah, when I was um, about six, my mom went to a uh, university with somebody from a Mennonite family in Southern Ontario. Uh -huh. And I spent two weeks of every summer between the time I was about eight and 14 on Mennonite farms. And wow. so it was cattle or dairy or chickens or something. And so I always was attracted to the farm life. But of course, I lived in the city. And then I moved out to Victoria. And I thought, when I have land, I'm going to have chickens. And so in 2000, I moved to Gabriola Island, lived on a small half acre, but four years later, moved on to acreage and got chickens. And I've had them ever since. Well, they're so delightful. They're fun to be around and they're very, very calming. And how I got involved with chickens was just as you said, you know, what happens to the brood when they go to mm -hmm. school? I got my first dozen chickens actually from the kindergarten class that my son was attending. And oh, we had had a small acreage. And so then we would just build on it year after year mm -hmm. after year. So the love certainly came from that. Did you ever belong to like 4-H or anything like that? Were you part of that? No, in, in no I belong to naturalist groups, but not 4-H uh, just because I lived in Toronto. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A little bit harder to do that. Yeah. So, you know, chickens themselves, there is some misconceptions about them that they are, you know, easy to take care of at home in your backyard. And I just want to put it out there that yes, while there might be easy, these are very, these are social animals and they require proper mm -hmm. care. So, you know, what's your routine for your birds? Um, I, I think you are right about people feeling they're almost a no maintenance pet that you sort of throw scratch on the ground, they peck away at, in some bucolic, you know, setting and you get an egg a day every single day. Yeah. And nobody ever thinks about the predators, the pests, the, you know, the illnesses, the injuries. Yeah. And yeah. I think unlike dogs and cats, most of us have grown up with a, a pet. So we have some experience with ticks or fleas or spraying this or that. And if we need vet care, vets are available and vets are relatively cheap. The problem with chickens is most of us don't know much about chicken health issues. And yes. then if we're prepared to take our a chicken to a vet, they're not trained. All yeah. DMV, so doctors of veterinary medicine, are trained in small mammals. It's actually a master's degree after that to get training with avian uh, issues. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's wow. a totally different biology, physiology, pathology. And so sometimes when I'm on these online groups and people actually do spend money uh, at a vet, I'm kind of horrified at what the diagnosis is or what the, you know, remedy is. Yeah. And it's just like, wow, you know, I, I think a lot of small animal vets are well-meaning, but they just don't understand chicken health. 
And and really, chicken health is something that we do need to pay attention to, uh, because like all of the other animals that we have, you know, they become at times they have their moments when they are really really he healthy and things are going well, and then they have seasons where their bodies change and they're mm -hmm, molting sure. and. And I, I can tell you that just, I know this is kind of a, it's bringing me back to some memories, but I remember the very first chicken I had, whose name was Penelope, beautiful, beautiful bird came with the property we bought. And our family was just, we were in love with Penelope. She didn't have a proper hen uh, cage or anything like that. She was free range, right all the way through she would come to the back door. She would listen to music. She'd hang out with the family. Uh, and then one day she went into molt and my family, we were horrified. We didn't know mm -hmm. how to help her. We didn't know she was going into the, into molt. And I have to tell you the poor angel, she just, you know, she would have like one feather here and one feather there. And, you know, it was really difficult mm -hmm. for us, like as a family, when you had had no experience to understand what was really happening to, to her. And of course she came out of it just fine. And, you know, it was, mm -hmm. it was great, but those, those early things, because like other animals they can't really tell you what's wrong with them you know I never noticed my chickens ever having a fever or ever having you know some of these mm. you know, things that you would notice with a four-legged animal you know I, I found it interesting how how I could gauge their health based mm -hmm. on whatever whatever the little red thing is at the top of their head is called a comb, a comb. Uh, and I could gauge the health based on that comb well, okay, so the difference between cats and dogs is they're predators. And so your cat or your dog is sick, sometimes they'll yelp or, you know, they'll whine. Chickens are prey and they're flock animals. And so if they show signs of illness, they're going to be predators, not just to them, but to the flock. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes they are able to hide their signs of illness until the day they die. I've woken up in the morning and found a dead hen in the the coop and yeah. done a you know a DIY necropsy and looked inside and you'd be amazed at what's going on internally that you don't see externally because if they lay down, you know, they're gonna be dinner for somebody. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I so, remember the vermin. We had everything. You know, my my at one point we had 36 birds. Generally speaking, it was 12 to 24 at any given time. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're quite right. I mean, we had everything from weasels to uh, silver hawk to even the bear would climb the wow. top because my my coop was actually an old horse paddock. And so that we converted. And so there was a great big black bear on the top of my chicken coop, mm -hmm. peeling back the roof while the birds were at the other end of the coop. So, but you're quite right that predators of all sorts come after a, a chicken, not so much in a, in a home backyard, but in, you know, when you've got acreage, have you had any major uh, catastrophes with your birds having, I you know, have... anything come after them? I have been so lucky. I'm on I'm four so and a half. I have four and a half acres, uh, and I have a lot of chicken keepers in my neighborhood who have experienced mink or raccoons. Yeah. Um, there was a mink in my pen once, and it took off when I went out there, and has never been back. I've had a oh, few losses God. from hawks, um, but my pen is thirty foot by forty foot, and it's totally covered over top with netting. Mm -hmm. And I have yep. had a couple of raccoon incidents but that's when hens snuck out to the shed and didn't make it back to the coop at night and I didn't notice and you can't blame a raccoon for finding an opportunistic meal in the evening but so the worst um, I think predator and the most ubiquitous is the one that people don't think of and that's dogs I have yeah. never had issues with dogs because my birds are pen now but if you go to online chicken groups, it's my dog, my neighbor's dog, because they're always around and people don't think about dogs as predators. And sometimes they're not meaning to kill a chicken. Chickens are pock pocking around and then suddenly they bolt and they're lots of fun. And you pick it up and shake it. And lo and behold, you've caused, you know, catastrophic injuries or deaths. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I know I had two Jack Russells and my girls would, 
mm -hmm. case the pan, they'd go up oh, and down. Sure. I had yeah. a shepherd, she'd case the pan up and down. And truth be told, they were they they were really, really good with the birds. But given the right moment, if I had not closed that coop mm -hmm. properly or in time, I, yeah, I could see where that would have been mm -hmm. definitely somebody's lunch. But one of the things that I've loved about chickens more than anything, and we were really glad to have you on the Act 3 version of uh, our television program, mm -hmm. and you shared with our viewers uh, how an egg is made and how e eggs are, you know, come down the mm -hmm. chain. And I just wonder for our listeners sake, if you'd be so kind to kind of go through that process with us again, would you mind sharing like how, where do eggs come from? For sure. It's the whole, the chicken and the egg. The okay, whole chicken so and the egg. Yeah. You probably know that women are born with all the ova, all the eggs that they will ever, uh, you know, have in their lifetime. Right. And so are chickens and they don't, they're not full formed eggs. They're teeny tiny. And if a hen died and you looked inside of her, you would see a number of eggs at all different stages. So let's think of it being like a conveyor belt. And at the very beginning of the conveyor belt, you have that yolk, the yellow part. And that is the food for a chick if you had a fertilized egg. And so that is the, you know, what it's feeding on for those 21 days that it's in an egg. And as it goes along the uh, conveyor belt, it picks up other components. So you've got the, the yolk and then you've got the albumin, which is the white that surrounds it. And those little white, I don't know what, you know, what they look like, little ropey things that I used to pick out of my eggs when I was a kid because I thought somehow they were related to chicks. They're not. It's a kind of a very tightly wound albumin and they're like bungee cords and they hold, they're on either side of the egg and they hold a fertilized egg and the embryo in place. So a hen actually has to turn her eggs several times a day if she's incubating them to make sure that the, ch the developing chick doesn't stick to the inside part of the shell. So she turns those eggs every day and it means that all the chicks get different parts of being under her. They get, hopefully, their incubated consistently and the humidity is consistent and so if she's uh sort of turning them you don't want that chick to go bonk so those little calaza as they're called hold that chick into place and then you know sometimes when you're peeling hard-boiled eggs and you have that little white membrane that you mm -hmm. I, I like to peel off so mm -hmm. that one goes on that's another part and there is one point that if a hen has um, <clears throat> mated with a rooster, she actually can, she has what are called sperm pockets in this reproductive tract. And she can hold that sperm inside of those pockets for up to 21 days. And then she can decide if she wants to use that sperm to fertilize an egg or not. And if she doesn't like that rooster, she can actually expel the sperm from her body. Oh, wow. So, so she can you, ditch the rooster. She can. She if can. he's pissed her off, she can say, yep. you are out of here, bud. Yep. Wow. And if, if you had your favorite rooster who died and you wanted to raise some of his babies and he had been mating with the hens for the next three weeks, it's possible that the eggs that they've laid might be fertilized by him because wow. it's from those sperm pockets that she pocket. Yeah, and she releases that. Oh my God, so, I, I had no idea. Yep, so then you get that, you get the membrane, and then you start to get the shell. And the shell is made out of microscopic particles of calcium carbonate, and they all come together like Lego, and they start joining, joining, joining. And if you actually looked at an egg under a microscope, there's holes in them. Eggs are actually porous. We think of them as solid and hard, but they they have very small holes and mm. the very last thing to come onto it is something called bloom or the cuticle you can't see it but sometimes if you wash an egg it changes color very slightly and what it does is it comes out sort of wet and then when it dries 
it protects all of the porous egg from bacterial uh, infections, things that might come in poop that might contaminate an egg, those kind of things. And you and know, so, I remember when I used to collect my eggs all that time, that poop, when mm -hmm. I went to wash the egg, that was some of the hardest stuff to come off of the egg was the poop itself, the way, just because of the way it came out of yes. the bird, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, yeah, and sometimes it's dirty feet, muddy feet. I clean eggs just very gently uh, with a cloth and warm water. Mm. Some people, like in some countries, they don't uh, refrigerate eggs. They leave them on the counter and they don't wash them until right before they use them. In Canada, mm -hmm. because we don't have widespread salmonella vaccinations in um, commercial hatcheries and, and where eggs are, you know, egg farms that... Mm -hmm they uh, wash them and then we have to refrigerate them because we've taken the bloom off. Off. I was going to say, is it the bloom that keeps them so that they're able to yep. stay unrefrigerated? As a sailor, I would take eggs, but yeah. if I was going quite a ways away, we had no refrigeration. And so you could leave them, you know, in a cool place for a short mm -hmm. period of time uh, and they would be just fine actually for often a couple of weeks and the eggs would be just fine. Mm -hmm. But I would, you know, but it's true that, you know, in Canada, we tend to throw our eggs in the, in the refrigerator yeah. always. Um, what's the difference? You, were, you talked about egg farms a moment ago, just the difference between that and free range. Um, you know, how, you know, is there truly a difference in those yolks? Okay. Yolk is actually made, um, what determines it, the color, that really kind of light yellow versus a really dark yellow. I remember when I went to Belize many years ago, they had free ranging chickens that probably ate a lot of garbage. Mm. And the eggs were quite disgusting because the yolk looked almost the same color as the white. Um, wow. like, yeah, they're like dark leafy greens, broccolis, um, marigolds. They'll make the yolk darker. Mm -hmm. So it is really, the yolk is based on what they're eating. Yeah. Now, the, all the terms around free range and organic, um, free range does not mean that they live on a big farm. Free range means that maybe they're not in a cage that's one foot by one foot by one foot. Yeah. But they might still be in a barn with thousands of birds. So I, that's a thing for me that I struggle with, and I know our listeners probably do as well, is when I think about what a chicken farm, you know, mm -hmm. is all about and how that's put together. And then I imagine, you know, I'm standing in front of any grocery store because we're all in the same position mm -hmm. now, as you pointed out a minute ago, there's free range, there's organic, but it just seems to be that there's a huge barrage of eggs that are there. Which ones are the healthiest? from your local from That's your right. local egg farmer really exactly. because when you think of yeah. like when you think about the lower mainland that has the uh, largest concentration of uh, commercial chicken farms in the province and when avian flu hit that area it was something like a million birds were euthanized so think about bird like big big barns where chickens never get out onto the ground, where there might be 10,000 birds in a barn. And somebody's job every morning is to pick up the dead hens and get rid of them. Um, and so there, that's one scenario. The other is they actually sit in a cage all day. And it takes 24 to 26 hours to make an egg. Yeah. And that egg drops into you know, a little conveyor thing. So it stays nice and clean. And that's all that hen does all day. And they debeak them. So they cauterize the tip of their beak because they get so bored that they peck their neighbors. And so to stop them from pecking and also plucking their own feathers out of stress, they take that end of the beak and there's nerve endings in a beak. That A beak is part of a chicken's sense of touch. Right. Some of those chickens have never been on the ground. Right. So the the breeds that are very typical in chicken farms are production layers. So they start laying at five, maybe to six months old. They do lay an egg a day. So you think about how much work it takes to make an egg. It's calcium, it's protein, it's water, it's all of those things. 
Hens actually take the calcium out of their long bones to make that egg and it, that calcium needs to be replaced all the time. Yeah. And then when they hit about 18, 20 months, they're considered spent. It doesn't mean that they won't lay anymore, but they're not at the height of their production. And then they go off and they're made into pet food. Yeah. So that's it for those birds. And they've had, you know, pretty miserable lives. And they're cheaper just, because... My, my soul is just hurting for those birds being mm -hmm. a cheaper. I just can't even... I can't even imagine. And I, I, I know that it's true. I remember the avian flu very, very well. I lived mm -hmm. in Maple Ridge. My my uh, neighbors had a quite a large uh, brood. They probably had a thousand mm -hmm. birds, uh, all free range, running around their yard, you know, in a in a very well kept uh, mm -hmm. uh, area. I had at that time, I think about 20 birds and I hid mine, to be honest with you, because we knew that nothing was there. There was no, mm -hmm. no, one, no, there was not, we had no concept of a sick bird. There hadn't been uh, any, mm -hmm. any conversation about them. And so I hid my birds and unfortunately my neighbor was not so lucky and he mm -hmm. lost his entire brood, which was absolutely heartbreaking. Oh, it's devastating. Well, it was because they had, there was no rhyme or reason. They just said, you know, this, we know that this is here. It wasn't it were anywhere where we were, but they didn't, it didn't matter. The mandate was the birds are gone. That's it. And so yeah, very, very devastating for everyone involved during that period of time. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that avian flu at times does reappear itself. And for the health and wellness of everyone, of course, we have to be cautious. Um, but at the end of the day, it just made no sense. And then, especially when you hear about 10,000 layers, right? 10,000 layers mm -hmm. that are, you know, pumping mm -hmm. out. Okay. You know, I, I can, I can see uh, again, the tragedy that goes with that. Mm -hmm. Having said that moving more on a positive note, that's one way that eggs are created or, or not created, but mm -hmm. created, I guess. For sure. uh, and, and for market. Um, and then there's, there's the happy farmers like we are, where we have a few birds that we love. Mm -hmm. I noticed uh, as well when you were on the program, and I've always been curious about this because I thought it was a different, you know, breed of bird would create a different color of the egg. So we talked about how mm -hmm. eggs are born, and then we started talking about the shell, and then I took us off into another part. But coming back to the actual production of eggs, at what point does that pigment change on those sweet little birds? You are right. There are specific breeds. So if you have a purebred dog or a purebred cat, you expect certain traits because they've been bred for generations. And so, you know, a poodle is going to have a certain kind of temperament or is going to have a certain kind of hair. With chickens, it is the same um, that there are certain breeds that um, genetics ha have evolved over time that lay different eggs. So most people know that uh, there's brown eggs and white eggs. Mm -hmm. And so I'll explain about that. So when I talked about calcium carbonate was what made the egg shell. So calcium carbonate is white. And so it makes a white egg, but how do you get brown eggs? So one of the things that happened on that conveyor belt that we talked about earlier. So there's different stages along the conveyor belt of that 24 to 26 hours, some of those stages, call them pit stops, might last just a few minutes and some of them are a few hours. And one of them is that a white egg can be sprayed by a brown pigment. Mm. And so there's about 13 genes that affect brown pigments. So you can have those very, very light to a very, very dark. And depending on what genes that hen carries. So when you crack open a brown egg, it's white on the inside and brown on the outside. And if you really scrubbed it, it would go back to being white. Mm. So one of the things that I have are blue and green egg layers. Mm. So the blue egg tint, the pigment comes from particular breeds. So Americana, Aracana, leg bars, there are certain ones that will lay blue. And what happens is that white egg is coming down the conveyor belt and the pigment doesn't just, it's not just an overlay on top of a white egg, it actually penetrates. 
So when you break open a blue egg, it's blue on the inside and blue on the outside. Oh, wow. So the inside of the egg is where blue. that, oh my God. Okay, I had no so idea. now we get to green eggs. Okay. So uh, if you know anything about colors, so the blue egg, so the white egg came down, the yeah. blue pigment penetrated the inside and the outside, but that hen also carries maybe a pigment for brown. And so as the blue egg passes, the brown pigment overlays the blue and turns green. But when you break the green egg, it's still blue on the inside. Wow. What so, about the blue ones that have the brown spots on them? Does that mean that it didn't get a full run through the system? Sometimes, or sometimes, is it just and sometimes that's just genetic in that hen that they have like for me, speckles are kind of a fun thing to have. So yeah. you'll have a lighter brown with dark spots, you know. That's mm -hmm. the fun of breeding chickens because personally, if you have a purebred, you know what you're going to get. But if you cross two, you never know what you're going to get. Wow. And so it's the fun of waiting to see what those offspring turn out to be like and what those hens lay six or seven months in the future. So speaking of that, there's also the various sizes that come for each of the eggs. And when they talk about sizing an egg, you know, you and I know that the size yes. of the egg isn't necessarily the actual physical size. It has to do with the yolk, correct? Yep. Yeah, it's so the weight. Yeah, and the size. Yep. It's the weight and the size. So the same bird can have all different size eggs, correct? Generally, the same bird will lay the same size. So when she first starts off, mm -hmm. she will probably lay what are called pullet eggs. They're quite a sm bit smaller. And then she eases up to that you know, regular size. And once in a while, they have um, so something happens and they lay a really tiny one. And they're called fairy eggs or fart eggs. Oh, and cute. they're really small. Yeah. And the pigment becomes darker because think about if you have a big egg and you're spreading brown pigment, but now yeah. we shrink it to half the size with the same amount of pigment. So that egg tends to be darker. Sometimes they have a teeny tiny yolk and, uh, and albumin and sometimes no yolk at all. Oh, I don't think. And I've that can be anything. just an, a glitch in the system. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think I've ever seen an egg come through on any of my birds that didn't have a yolk. I would commonly get double yolkers. Okay. And then have you had one of my neighbors reported when she broke open the egg, there was a totally formed second egg in there. I've and never that's had that. Because wow. On, when, when you're thinking about the production line, yeah. Before one egg got enclosed in that calcium carbonate, another one happened and got, I know. That's so amazing. So you can have triple yolkers. So that double yolk is when instead of each of them forming separately, a second yolk got in here and got enclosed. Yeah. And and I was always excited when we would have a double yolker because they're, mm -hmm. you know, we we never, we didn't, we, we got them regularly but yeah. not commonly, if that makes any sense. Like they were often enough, but not yep. all. Yeah. I think that chicken farmers are happy with those, but think of the hen that lays them. Oh. And sometimes now when you go into the grocery store, you know, they've got their sizes, but they also have boxes of just double yolks. One of the things that happens to hens is they get a lot of reproductive tract issues. About 30% of laying hens will get ovarian cancer. So think about an animal that that evolved from an Asian jungle fowl that probably had, just like most birds, one or two clutches a year, just laid a few eggs and had a few babies. And yeah. over time, it is the most populous animal, pro probably the most populous bird on the planet. And some of those birds are laying, you know, upwards of 300, 350 eggs a year stuff happens and so they get a lot of issues related to the reproductive tract and that's usually what takes out hens as they get older i think that the hens that i got that were not coming from schoolyards were retired birds that they were mm -hmm. going to send off to slaughter and i was like you're not killing that bird it ain't mm -hmm. happening 
And while I didn't get an egg from her every day, I might get one a couple of times a month. I might get one a couple of, you know, once a week or whatever. So they were still going through, but mm -hmm. I, I had some pretty old birds. What What's the average age of a chicken? Okay, so let predators are a big one, disease, injuries, all of those kinds of things. My yeah, oldest yeah. ones now are about six. That's pretty good. And then I start to expect that maybe they're going to get some reproductive tract things. But people do have eight or 10. You know, a friend of mine, her hen went into the nest box and started, you know, the egg song. And lo and behold, at 11, she laid an egg that she had not laid for a long time before that. Oh, so it, they do last, you know, I think probably 20, age 20 is about the record. I will never forget my Penelope, who was our first. Unfortunately, our Penelope did find demise to what we believe is a dog or a coyote got her. Mm -hmm. um, however, when she was in her moment of glory, you know, we didn't know where she was stashing her eggs. And then, of course, one day I was clearing it away to act because I we were planning on having friends for her. So these are in the very early years, mm -hmm. right? Just very, very early years. And I remember pulling, you know, taking the, the rake and pulling things away, pulling things away from the base of the, mm -hmm. the bottom of the horse paddock. And there, lo and behold, there were probably, I want to say a hundred eggs, all in this beautiful mm -hmm. pile. Of course, all of them had been, were rotten. None of them were usable by that point. Who knows how many years mm -hmm. she'd been going or how long she'd been saving her eggs and that they weren't found by a raccoon or another creature, which is what was astonishing to mm -hmm. me. Um, but I, I think the oldest bird that I had was probably, I want to say five or six. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to talk more about birds with you. And we are not done this conversation. We are, however, going to take a little bit of a station identification because I want to prep people up to think about reaching out to you, maybe joining your blog or learning a lot more about some of the things you do. So I encourage you all right now, if you don't mind, just as I'm busy, you know, doing a bit of station identification, go grab yourself a piece of paper and a pen so that you can take down the information that we'll have for you shortly after our return. Uh, in the Zoom booth with me, I have Claire Deneen. She's with Bitch and Chickens. I'm loving the name. I'm going to find out how she got that name because really it's a good one. Uh, but before we do that, let's just talk a little bit about what's going on right around now. We are in the beginnings of spring. I know it was a little bit ago and there's lots of things coming ahead uh, with the freshness of the new year. But of course, we are uh, committed to our community in every way we possibly can be. So I encourage you to check things out in the community. Make sure that the elders in your neighborhood are being cared for. Check and make sure that they are coming through with their some of their spring season, open up their doors, maybe give them a hand sweeping off the walk, getting them ready to open up their doors to enjoy the spring days. It's always good to be kind to your neighbor. And really, it does make a difference to the people that are in our hood. So do yourself a favor and say hi to somebody nearby you today. And if you're also thinking about what am I going to do, I, it's, the weather's not quite there yet. I'm not quite ready yet. Do yourself a favor. I just heard that it's not time to plant this week, even if you want to. Understandably so. We know that this uh, season is just at the very, very beginning. And that the frost, according to the Farmer's Almanac this year, will be the first week of May. So this is a great time to plant. But just be careful when you're out there planting off the moment. It's so wonderful to start that process. But the best part is actually going into the dirt and looking to see where all those wonderful little shoots are coming up. So take a look in your yard and see what surprises that you have and also again we are very committed to our community so we encourage you to check out any of the local uh community farmers there's you know cd sundays and all kinds of things happening within the community make sure you check out your local listings and see who's in your hood that you can maybe check out a local farmer a local chicken entrepreneur or someone who knows just what to do when it comes to sending uh, the planted things that we want to do this season. So I encourage you to do that. So thanks again for tuning in to Act 3 this week on the Zoom uh, conversation with me today is Claire Deneen. She's with Bitch and Chickens, and we're now going to talk with her once again. Welcome back to the program. Thank you so much, Claire. I am really happy that you're here. And I also told people a minute ago that, you know, it. how'd you get the name Bitch and Chickens? Because I really think it's fantastic. What inspired you to get that name? 
I'm kind of a little bit of a grammar queen. I'm always interested in language. I actually took Latin for two years in high school. So I kind of like bitchin means excellent, you know, but it also means complaining. And so <laughs> I think that sometimes people, you know, there's some um, city regulations about roosters because people think roosters are loud. My hands make far more noise than yes. my roosters ever have. And, yeah. you know, they they talk a lot. They have opinions. And so it's that combination of kind of, you know, talking and how great chickens are. Well, I love the name and I think you're absolutely right. You know, I, I remember when I would get the schoolyard roosters. Uh, well, I'd get the schoolyard eggs that had hashed. Mm -hmm. And of course, it takes a little bit of time to determine whether it's going to be a rooster or it's going to be a mm -hmm. chicken, especially if you're a novice. But even more so, it takes a while to figure it out. And I remember one year we had seven roosters and only the remaining ones were hens. Um, and I just remember thinking, well, what am I going to do? You can only have one rooster because otherwise mm -hmm. they'll try to kill each other. I remember having them grow, of course, <clears throat> and you can speak to this much better than I can, but when you do bring new birds to the flock, <clears throat> you need to bring them in slowly. You need to, mm -hmm. you know, you have to be really careful on how you do that because you can make, you can make your birds unwell. But I was like, what am I going to do with these? What am I going to do with these mm -hmm. roosters? Because they are, they were so loud, especially when they became teenage roosters. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in my family, we ended up selling the birds uh, to a local butcher, and he would uh, mm -hmm. he would uh, use the, the uh, sell them or do whatever it was that he did with them. I couldn't kill the bird unless the bird was sick. If the bird was sick, I was the mm -hmm. person responsible for making sure that that bird didn't suffer. Uh, but when they're, you know, alive mm -hmm. and teenagers, I couldn't just wring their necks as as much as at times I wanted to why can't you have these birds? Like, why are they so fussy with each other? Why can't roosters hang out like night, you know, the way hens do? Well, I think that there's lots of animals that um, males are part of a group, a herd or a flock. And then the young ones go off and hang out as teenagers. And you can have what's called a bachelor flock. Mm -hmm. um, so they will live um, and coexist quite well but oh. they have to be out of earshot and and being able to see hens but if you just kept them on your own and some people do they love their roosters roosters tend to be the the friendliest of chicks they're quite loving the competition comes Beautiful. around Beautiful. resources for sure yeah. um you know when you think about big hatcheries and when they hatch chicks what happens to all those day old roost like the the cockerels baby baby roosters yeah do you know what happens to them no they grind them up they put them in a, a little machine and they grind them up and they kill them right at hatch because the hens go off to either become layers or meat birds you know and that's what happens and so for all of us small flock people who hatch statistically you're going to get 50% roosters, 50% hens. Every once in a while, I'm lucky and I get more hens than roosters. But I always say to people, if you're going to hatch, what are you going to do with those roosters? And sometimes you can have one or two roosters, especially if you've got lots of hens and you've got lots of space and they do coexist. But the term pecking order you know, really, <laughs> chickens yes. peck the ground, they peck the environment, but they peck each other, right? Yes. And they are always, they peck always to reinforce that hierarchy. And yes. so when you bring in new birds or when you have competition over resources, meaning hens, there will be more pecking, right? And so I have one yes. rooster and, and they do tend to talk more. So like when I've had one dog, it's been a lot quieter than when I've had two. Always. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So always. somebody barks I mean, at the door way and than... has to join in. And it's Probably. the same with roosters. So, you know, yes. it's about thinking about that in advance. Um, you know, some people so, are prepared to eat their birds and that's okay. But you do and, have to think about where to rehome them. And so that's what I was going to ask you. Do you, do you use your birds as part of your diet? 
as well? Do you eat your birds or not? I don't, but I have friends who are perfectly happy to take them and eat them. And I'm, I donate them to those folks. And, yep. you know, one of the things I started my Facebook page because I thought it would be a good place for me to be selling hatching eggs, but also to find homes for roosters because my roosters have gone to, you know, Port Alberni and Machosin and Salt Spring Island and Quadra Island because I was able to advertise and people would pass through. I live on Gabriola, but I work in Nanaimo and people would pass by or I travel with my job and I could take a rooster someplace. Yeah. Facebook now has banned all animal sales and rehoming posts including free things and you can get shut down if you try to do that and so oh the my opportunity, god i had no idea yeah they don't oh enforce it uniformly but once you've been flagged you're repeatedly flagged and they all shut your account down and mm -hmm. so i That's now so um used used nanaimo or kijiji but i do try to find homes for roosters where people are not going to eat them and they need a replacement for the one that they've had, or, you know, they've never had a rooster and you, roosters are actually a really integral part of a flock. They're not just pretty, but they manage conflicts. They bring food, they fight off predators. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah, I had one rooster for a while um, and we didn't have the capacity you know, I had a growing son and he just was, you know, becoming a teenager and it just mm -hmm. was not working. And I was working um, and my husband was as well. So it was a little bit, we just couldn't do the full end. We could do mm -hmm. the chickens, but there's a little bit more maintenance that goes with a rooster. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was the same as you. I would prefer the birds would have gone mm -hmm. to somewhere, but at least I know they weren't wasted, right? They didn't. For sure you know, they didn't die an untimely death. I mean, I am surprised about the rules regarding, to, uh, you know, posting that. I would think that that would be a wonderful way for us to be able to share healthy animals and make sure that mm -hmm. they're given safe homes. So, um, so speaking of that part of it for the, for your, for your purposes uh, um, and, and your raising of your birds, um, uh, you know, how, how big is your flock? How, like, how big is too big for a city? Like, is there, there are rules about our city. Mm -hmm. I know that I think in Nanaimo, we're allowed to have two birds. I think maybe four, I'm not sure. I think it's probably at least four. Yeah. Mo most municipalities will allow you to have three or six or whatever, but no roosters because of the crowing. And, you know, yeah. there are roosters that crow a lot, um, mm. I've been super lucky that I don't have loud roosters. I live on an island and I live with acreage. Uh, currently, I have about 24 hens and a rooster. Mm. And occasionally, it creeps up there, especially when you hatch chicks. Yeah. And I don't, I, I want to see how they grow out, but I also want to see what color egg they lay. Of and I course. don't always know until they start laying and they might not lay till they're six, seven, eight months old. And so I end up keeping a few and then I downsize some. Um, you know, there is something called chicken math. So people get four or six and they're quite happy with that, but then they want a different color bird or they want a different color egg or their neighbors are downsizing a few. Could they take those? And you know, on Facebook groups, there's a lot of jokes about chicken math because, you know, people get more and more, but it is hoarding in a little way because I think what happens is, imagine that you live in a house with four roommates and then somebody decides to move in a whole bunch of other ones without telling you and without consulting you. And people think, well, chickens can't count and they don't know these things. Chickens, you know, up to about 30, is a good size. And then after that, it's like, it creates more stress because every time somebody comes into or out of the flock, they're stress. Yeah. They have to reestablish a pecking order over again. And Absolutely. one of the things that triggers disease is stress. Yeah. So yeah. think about what your chickens want, not just what you want, right? So I've well, really tried to have a handle on 
you know, and when I had four or six, the cleaning requirements are less, right? Especially in the winter when they're in the coop many more hours and they've got dirty feet and they're pooping in the coop instead of outside. And, you know, so you have to think about that stuff. And also in terms of illness, what we talked about earlier, it's hard to spot that one chicken that might be ill in a flock because there's so many of them that yeah. you don't notice. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I agree with you from a stress perspective, but mm -hmm. I also, we had to muck out quite a bit and you mm -hmm. really, I mean, the smell for chickens, for people that are not, you know, if they, well, four or six chickens, you don't notice it so much, but when you start getting 30 chickens, there, mm -hmm. you know, the mucking out processes and you want to keep disease down as far as you can. Um, and just the overall health and the vermin that go with that as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I know, uh, the one thing I hated about having my birds, I loved my birds more than life itself, but I'm reminded always Nanaimo, I, I had my birds on Maple Ridge. Nanaimo is known for rats. I had rats mm -hmm. in Maple Ridge. The feed brought them. Um, you know, mm -hmm. you got to be careful that that is not an overpopulation of those types of vermin as mm -hmm. well. So it, it's a lot more than just having a couple of chickens in the yard and saying, you know, mm -hmm. you know, these guys are really cute and I'm going to have an egg, you know, Mm -hmm. through and through well However, and think about too if you have 20 or 30 chickens and you want to go away so having a chicken sitter is a little different than having a dog sitter because most people don't know about chickens and so you come home and there's a chicken that's been sick that nobody noticed or oh they're sitting on eggs that now have been incubated for five days and you didn't want any chicks so that becomes more of a tie too. I do have an automatic door on my coop. And oh, so good. it's it's battery operated, but it's a solar sensor and you can tweak it. So essentially it opens um, when it's light in the morning and then it closes after they go to bed. And it's and a fantastic investment. Yes, but I still go out just to check just in case, but it is something that is useful. But you still have to be putting down fresh food and water. Um, you can't just go away for days without somebody looking in on your chickens. Absolutely. But chickens are very, very smart. They know to go, in, uh, surprisingly smart, mm -hmm. actually. They know when it's time to get up and go out. They know when it's time to go to bed. As soon as the dusk starts to come, mm -hmm. they're heading towards their coop. They're really, really great that way. However, like you said, you need to have some kind of an automatic door or something because mm -hmm. you have an open door and you have birds mm -hmm. you're attracting as well. You know, those, those night creatures, the raccoons and the monks or the minks. Well, and the, that's right. You, and, you can't, you can't stay downtown after work and go out to dinner and a movie and get home at 11 o'clock and the raccoon has come in, yeah. you know, so there is that. Um, yeah. And I've had more than one bloodbath in my day. And let me just mm -hmm. say, not a pretty picture to come home to. It's devastating for everyone. So, you know, if mm -hmm. you're thinking about having chickens, do your research, pay attention, make sure that you, you know, check out your blog. Speaking of which, this is a great segue to getting people to figure out how do they reach you? How do they learn more? How do people find you? Okay. On Facebook, I'm Bitchin' Chickens Farm. Same on um, Instagram. And so I post there daily. I just started a YouTube channel and it's capital B bitchin dot capital C chickens. And my blog is www bitchin chickens, all one word, all lowercase dot com. So my blog, so originally, as I said, I started the Facebook page thinking, I would just post ads for my hatching eggs or chicks or things. And then I started, actually, you know where Bitch and Chicken started? My egg customers would ask me questions. So I started a little thing that I took an eight and a half by 11 inch fluorescent paper, cut it lengthwise and typed out something interesting. And I called it Bitch and Chicken's News. And so I would say, hey, do you ever wonder why you've got blue eggs? And I would talk about egg genetics or I would talk about the seasons and what was going on. And so my egg customers would be, oh, this is really interesting. So then I started posting things to educate 
just you know other folks and so the my wordpress blog is the home to about 700 articles i sort of just wow. got into i know i spend a lot of time but i've Good worked for a you lot though with, i think it's fantastic i yeah, love it so i i've done a hmm. lot about chicken health issues i've partnered with other chicken keepers around chicken coop design so i found people who've done really interesting coops and featured their um their builds uh, i started a series called when um <clears throat> when art meets chickens so i featured writers crafters artists about their work so it could be a poet it could be a painter or a potter I've done those kind of, and I've met people all over the world because sometimes these people live in the Netherlands or in Vietnam and I'm posting their work. Uh, another series is having chickens is a great way to meet your neighbors. I've done about 49 um, profiles of people who keep chickens and it's a combination Love it. wow. about how did they come to Gabriola, most of them are Gabriola, a few of them are from Nanaimo, but how did they come here? Tell me something about yourself and tell me something about your chickens. And so there's those kind of things, but I've also partnered with, so you said you lived in the lower mainland. Mm -hmm. That's the home of where all the big chicken farms in this province are. It's also the home of the Minister Ministry of Agriculture's Animal uh, health center and that's where they do a lot of testing and necropsies so it could be around avian flu but if you had a cow or a chicken that died you would send it for necropsy and I went to a workshop several years ago with one of the vets who'd been there for she's been there now more than three decades so she she is a DVM a doctor of veterinary medicine she has a master's degree in avian pathology she's board certified in the uh, United States as well as Canada. And she happens to have a part-time house here. And so we connected and every few months we get together and I show her all these cool cases that I found on the internet or people have sent me. And we sit down and we try to talk about what's going on. You know, let's look at these x-rays or let's look at the necropsy pictures and let's talk about all the weird and wacky things that happened to chickens and I write them up as case studies. And so I think we've just bypassed about 300 wow. uh, of those. Yeah, That's so people so send impressive. me all kinds of, of stuff. Yeah, and people send me, you know, my chicken had space surgery and I'll say, great, can you send me the x-rays and can I talk to your vet and ask them how they did the surgery and the vet will actually send me, you know, this is the surgery. I uh, connected with a woman in the States who works at a teaching ho a veterinary hospital and her chicken had a, uh, a heart issue and had heart surgery. First oh, one in the God, world. Oh, and it was, they gosh. talked about it at some conferences in the States, but I got the, the actual footage from the heart surgery and pictures of the OR when all of this was going on. And so I've, I'm always trying to challenge myself to find more and more interesting things. And I have a lot of non-chicken owners who follow my blog because they're just really interested in chickens. Well, you know what? I'm going to be your new biggest fan because Great. I personally think that this you know, I, I adore the birds, but I find uniquely fantastic the people like yourself that take such good care of these beautiful, beautiful creatures that we have wandering around. Birdies are, I mean, I just love them. And I'm, I miss my birds probably more than, I mean, I've thought many times about bringing birds back into my life, right? Uh, not quite there yet, but definitely when I'm ready, I'll be checking you out. Okay, you can check my eggs. I'm going to be checking your eggs and checking you out completely. Thank you so much for being on the program. Before you go, we've just got a couple of minutes left or, and we're almost at the end uh, of our program, which blows my mind. It's gone so quickly. Um, if you could imbibe on our community a, a great teaching, actually quickly before I get there, just like, just do you have one bird that's your favorite? Like, is yeah, there one... 
Sky, I have what are called frizzles, some, and it is a gene. It's not a breed. It's a gene that causes, uh, creates curled feathers. Oh, so she's so that's the breed. But what's her name? So she looks like a big feather duster, not like a silky, but curled feathers, and she has a very big uh, crest. Oh, and so it's this funky, yeah, and the she's really name? friendly. She's what's underfoot all the sky. Sky. That is her name, Sky. Oh, good. Yeah. All right. Well, for Sky, for all of the chicken lovers uh, out there, including myself, if you were to to leave us with, you know, a real a nugget of wisdom for people that are interested in chickens or breeding them or seeing them or being part of that whole life, what would be your teaching for this moment? Chickens make a great pet, but do your research. Um, they're not for everyone. And so just make sure that you are able to manage the responsibility of time and space and commitment and the, you know, and, um, you know, connect yourself with a good community so that you're supported when you do uh, experience those bumps in the road, because you will. You will. And those bumps, it's important that you get the advice from people mm -hmm. who know what they're doing. Thank you so much, Claire Deneen from Bitch and Chickens. It's been a pleasure to talk with you for this last hour. I look forward to sharing more of your information on our YouTube platform, on iHeartRadio and on Spotify, as well as right here on CHLY 101.7 FM. Hope you had a great day, everybody. Thanks again, Claire. Enjoy. We'll talk to you next week. See you next time on Act 3.